The following podcast is a proud member of the Blue Collar Roots Network. Find all the shows by visiting bluecollarroots.com. You found the Building HVAC Science Podcast. Here's the host, Bill Spohn. Welcome back to another episode of the Building HVAC Science Podcast. We're out there to create more knowledgeable HVAC and building performance technicians by helping the two professions to better understand each other with the ultimate goal of making customers happy, in the homes they live in, and the buildings they work in. I'm your host, Bill Spohn. I can easily summarize this episode with a single quote from Craig Migliaccio's LinkedIn bio. The quote goes, remember that we are all teachers need to invest in others to succeed. Now you may have heard of Craig as his HVAC training books and YouTube videos continue to grow in popularity. He's been interviewed on other podcasts also. You can find him on the AC Service Tech channel on YouTube. He's always been a problem solver, including solving the problem of teaching himself how to write some of the most thoughtfully developed HVAC training materials out there. I have a number of links in the bio and listen to the conversation. Craig really approaches the topic of HVAC education very thoughtfully. I think you'll get something out of this. Craig, how you doing? Hey, how you doing, Bill? Good. I'm doing great. Craig hails from New Jersey. Is that correct? Yes. Have you been there all your life? Born and raised in Southern New Jersey at the very Southern tip. Wow. And you are... AC Service Tech, is that what you call your YouTube channel? (laughs) Yeah. Yep. So 2016, we had started the AC Service Tech YouTube channel. Correct. It's a lot more than that right now. And how did that sort of all develop? Why don't you just take me back a little bit to when you first got involved with the trades? Yeah, sure. Before I had started any of the YouTube and any of the teaching, what I was doing is I Out of high school, I was thinking, what kind of a career field do I want to get into? And something that everybody has in their home, HVAC system. So whether they have a heater, air conditioning system, or water heater. So I got into the trade. And the first place I started working at didn't really work out too well. Just a negative environment is what that was. So I was there for about three months. But the next place I was at, J. Maloney and Son Heating and Cooling at that time, they put me with a installation manager of about 35 years. His name was John O'Donnell, and he taught me. And so I looked up to him and I took notes. I asked him, hey, can I take notes at lunchtime if it's not going to slow us down? Or can I ask questions while we're working? And he said, no, that's fine, because I wanted to make sure I was not slowing the flow of work down. So that was great. I had a little binder, wrote all my notes. There was no really such thing as YouTube then. <laughs> so I was learning everything I can from him. So what's that time frame? That was in 2002. Okay. Yeah, 2002. So anyway, time progressed and I ended up with my own installation truck and I with this company progressed and moved up the ranks and then I had my own helper. And so I really enjoyed teaching the helper that I had. And then he progressed, then he became an installer as well. And over time, I started doing service as well as the installation during the day. And then I was on call at night and in the weekends, we had a rotation. And then I had another helper come through and was teaching that individual. And I really enjoyed that type of thing, teaching what I did know. I knew I didn't know everything, but I just taught what I know. So between that and working with the kids in the youth group at our church, That was another thing, the high school age and also kind of college age. But at that time, that's where I was. But with the high school students and junior high, I I was doing some mentoring and there along with them in their life. And once again, I I found out that I really enjoyed teaching and giving at least of me that support for somebody else to grow. What I found when I teach, I don't do nearly as much as you do. Maybe cumulative over time I have, but (laughs) you're a little younger than me. What I find is Just like what you said, you're sensitive to the workflow. So you exhibit a lot of care and concern for the work you do. And when you do that, you must have to even learn it better or learn more. How does that work? This is something that when I was teaching in the classroom, we're going to fast forward a little bit and then we'll get back to the story. But in the classroom, I was always reminding the students, they would like to have conversations. And I would say, hey, conversations are fine as long as you don't stop working. And you also need to know when to stop talking because 
if it's taking your concentration off of the subject and what you're doing, whatever the procedure is, then you're just going to have to respectfully say, hey, can we get back to that? I'm just trying to focus at this point in time. So that's a big thing. It's all of those life skills that you want to try to teach the younger generation in order to do. So problem solving is a huge one, your time management. It's like this self-assessment thing where you want to try to give your employer a fair shake and realizing that if you do that, they're going to want to invest in you. Give and take. Absolutely. Back to the story, get us back to. So between working with the youth group kids and teaching the helpers that were kind of flowing through me, I would have a helper maybe for about a year or so. And so went through several helpers and then they started doing their own thing. So between those things, what happened was the owner of the company sold the company and I decided to go out on my own. And so after just a few years of experience, I started doing my own thing. And so I started a half carpentry, half HVAC business. And so most of the people in my family were carpenters. So I was the odd one out. But my grandfather had an architectural business at the time as well. So if I had questions, I would ask him as far as some weight loads and things like that in the building structure. And my uncle was a carpenter and I would actually sub him out. And so we would work together. I would come on some of his jobs. He would come on some of mine. I also had started doing a little subcontracting from the old owner of Jay Maloney and Son because he started a general contracting business. I didn't do a whole lot because we ended up getting referrals like right away from people that knew me. And that was from a lot of people within the church. I had also put out some ads and things like that in the local papers. And the referral basis really grew pretty dramatically. And after that first year, I really didn't need to do much advertising. And in the area in which I live at, there's a lot of different possible clientele to work for, whether it's the million dollar homes on the beach or the forgotten inland people. Everybody needs help. There's hotels, There is all kinds of different varieties, commercial restaurants and things like that, seasonal places. But anyway, so in the midst of all that, so I've been bouncing around. And so I had that company. And one of the next things that happened, I got married. We had our first daughter and we were thinking about health insurance at the time. And so I thought, hey, maybe I should look into a teaching or maintenance position because that's where my passion is with teaching. I ended up taking a maintenance position. I don't think I shared this with you before, but I took a maintenance position at a school in Vineland. And it was the last stop for a lot of students that would maybe not be able to do high school in their normal high school. So somebody that maybe got in trouble or whatever. This was kind of the last stop. That was Pineland Learning Center in Vineland. And so there I got to work with some students. So as I'm doing, say, a maintenance project, I might, through their career program, I was able to work with, say, a student at a time doing a maintenance project. I could only selective projects that I could do that with the students on, but I felt that was really rewarding. And once again, within that age group. And so that age group of, I would say, 17 to 20 is huge for me because at that point, you have a young person that is trying to make decisions for the rest of their life with the limited amount of experience that they have. And so they're getting their driver's license, they're making big decisions, moving out or with a career field or even like girlfriend marriage, all these types of things are in play. And so a person at this point in time has huge potential, but they could also end up in a pit and sometimes need a little help in order to just get by in life. And some people don't have a great family life and some people are blessed with a mom and a dad or a good family, maybe grandparents stuff. Everybody's different. And so I just find that age group very interesting to be able, if I'm going to try to do anything for anybody, like it's like that, if I could be a support or try to help at that age. And so. Such a huge pivot point, like you say, and also not understanding the ramifications of decisions and choices that are made at that age. I've done a little reading, amateur psychology reading, and they talk about the fact that the brain really isn't fully formed until like in the mid 20s. So there's still a lot of things going on where things, people aren't thinking the same way that you and I think at that age. Yeah. During that whole time, I started thinking about trying to get into teaching at the technical high school in my area. And so actually also they had a career program at the school in which I was working at. So really it was kind of like a dual thing. Well, I started looking at the state's requirements to become a technical teacher. And they really look highly on somebody that has 
the experience. So I looked on the HVAC teaching and submitted my documents. And during this time, I also started teaching at night at the local high school. I taught building maintenance there. And so I kind of already got into that, doing that. And I liked investing in adults as well. And so I thought that was like a foot in the door at the school. And I enjoyed teaching. It got me a little bit more experience in teaching. So during that whole time, I was applying to the state, trying to get my teaching license. And basically, I just kept getting rejected at the state level. And so I followed all of their instructions to the T. And so basically, you had to have four years of HVAC experience at that point in time. Within the last 10 years, I had my business like a half carpentry, half HVAC, but in their instructions, and that was over 10 years, and I had it. It wasn't a problem, like in my mind and in my even my accountant's mind. So my accountant laid out, we looked at all of my invoices, put them all down into hours and everything. Did a lot of work, a lot of expensive work for me. And I submitted this and they said, no, you don't have enough hours. And they literally, it was either in a phone call or an email. I'd have to, I don't know, I haven't looked in that stuff in a long time. But they said, no, self-employed people only work 20 hours a week. And I was like, are you kidding me? What? And so that was their response. And so I was like, you got to be kidding me. I'm like 60, 80 hours. Like, (laughs) what is this nonsense? And so they only wanted to give me basically the building maintenance certificate, or it's actually a CE, Certificate of Eligibility to Teach. I'm passionate about teaching. I wanted to do what I need to do in order to be set up, ready to go. And I wanted the Certificate of Eligibility for HVAC. And they were saying no. I kept saying, well, I first submitted it. They said no. I submitted it with the accountant, verifying all my invoices, literally everything I had for as long as I kept everything. That's an important reason why you want to keep everything you have. And then I even said, what if I hire an attorney to verify that the accountant's correct? And they said, so the only other alternative I had besides arguing, fighting, or trying to just push harder, and I was under a timeline because I knew that the HVAC position at the county technical high school was opening up. So my only alternative was to go with a two years of HVAC experience and two years, well, actually an associate's degree, which I did not have. I only did one year of college out of high school before I decided that I wanted to do hands-on. And that's when I entered into the HVAC trade. What happened then was I said, well, maybe I can go ahead and get this associate's degree because I had 19 college credits by that point in time, just from that first year after high school. I went towards like mechanical engineering and I took some hard classes first because I said, hey, if I'm going to do this, I don't want to take the easy stuff. I want to take the hard stuff and see if I can do it. I never really felt like I was extremely intelligent or anything like that. This has been my whole life's thing. It's how hard you try, how hard you push. That's it. And that's what I always tell to other people too. It's it's not a matter of how gifted or smart you are <laughs> just as a natural person. It's just how much you want it how much you push and what your desire is. And that that is it, really, I believe. So I went to Thomas Edison State College online and picked out an associate's degree in electrical mechanical studies. And so basically, I got about 42 college credits in roughly three months, not only from them, but from prior learning assessments. I'm sorry, the prior learning assessments were from Thomas Edison. And then the other ones were Clep or Dante's exams, where basically you are testing out of classes that you already know. College level examination program, something. Yeah. Yeah. So a friend of mine, he had a book on how to write just English writing. I studied that for 16 hours and then took the test and ended up passing it and getting six college credits. That was a CLEP test, I believe, or a Dante's exam. So basically between that and doing the prior learning assessments every weekend, I was writing this like say 13 or 16 page paper. And I was submitting that to somebody there that had a doctorate in that field. And basically, they they were just saying, you're good. It was on some type of subject that had to do with HVAC. Sure. You proved the mastery through your writing. Exactly. And so the biggest problems were with my sentence or my grammatical problems or at that point in time, being able to write a 13 or 16 page paper because I had never done it before. That was where they corrected me, not necessarily on the technical answers. And so I got those 42 college credits. I got an associate's degree. I took one class Basically, I took one class to get a GPA. That's what they required because otherwise I had nothing to base it on. It was all just pass or fail. And so I took one class. I got a 4.0 on that. So I got an associate's degree with a 4.0. So you rolled the dice once. Yeah, there you go. (laughs) (laughs) 
I'm thankful that they allowed me to do that accelerated process because they didn't necessarily want to do that. But I'm like, no, we have to do that. or Otherwise, there's no point in me doing this. So I got the associate's degree just in time to then submit to the state along with my work experience. And finally, I got a certificate of eligibility for sheet metal and HVACR. So I was doing that at night and on the weekends, writing these papers while my kids were young. And I just, my thought was I wasn't going to let anybody stop me from what my goals were. I'm just going to push through and we're going to do this. Somehow this is going to happen. And so I got my certificates of eligibility. And what that means is that you have to get hired first in the field of HVAC or building maintenance or something or sheet metal in order to then go into a one-year program. It was called the alternate route. And so if you don't have a college degree and you're looking to teach and you're looking to teach a technical subject matter, the states usually want somebody with the technical experience over maybe somebody that just went to college. But you still can get you still can get a certificate of eligibility if I was an engineer in that field. So anyway, I got hired at the County Technical High School as their HVAC teacher, and it was the program was HVACR slash S E. <laughs> And that was heating, ventilating, air conditioning, refrigeration, and sustainable energy. So green renewables. So I was teaching wind and solar thermal and photovoltaic. So all of those things. And obviously, I needed to catch up on all that stuff because- That's a whole set of other topics. That's a whole other thing. Yeah. The big thing with it is getting into a position like that, you feel that you want to help the young people as much as you can, but you also feel not equipped. And so me, myself, I never went to a public or technical school or private technical school to learn HVAC beforehand. So I felt like I was at a disadvantage, but now I look at it as it's probably an advantage because I would have probably just fallen into whatever I was taught, like the structure in which I was taught. What instead happened was once I got into that position, I was staying at night and I was doing experiments and I was trying to figure out ways to make sure that what I was teaching them was actually legitimately correct and not just something that's passed down. I think it's very important to not just you hear it. Now you're going to pass that on or it's something that you got by and now you're passing that on. I wanted to make sure what I'm saying was the absolute truth or actually correct thing. And so that was a huge learning experience for me. And That even within our organization right now at AC Service Tech, that's a huge thing when we're bringing somebody on. It's like, we need you to be a problem solver. You have to be somebody that sees the problem and is not just waiting for somebody else to teach you or somebody to guide you through it. You have to be able to identify a problem, experiment or whatever you need to do, whether that's searching on Google, on YouTube or whatever. There's tons of technological things that I have no idea how to do, but we do them because we just look up how to do them. (laughs) And it's kind of one of those things. That's in my way to communicate what I want that's on my heart to you. And if that's in the way, then that needs to get out of the way. So we need to learn it and figure it out. Even if that's not necessarily what I'm exactly passionate about, it has to get done. You have to have the conviction in what you're teaching by some form of personal experience with it, the best you can gain. Yeah, absolutely. So I had all of these, the experience with cutting sheet metal, making field plenums and transitions and doing all the duct work and doing the brazing and installing a whole system or troubleshooting and like all of that's fine. But it's those things are not hard to communicate, but you do want to just also verify to make sure that what you are saying is correct. And then you want to test out the way I look at things is that if I put a dot on a piece of paper, I want to come at it from maybe eight different angles or something like that. I don't want to put a number on it, but you want to come at it from a bunch of different ways to make sure that you have communicated it well, because just because it makes sense to you when it comes out of your mouth, it doesn't mean that that makes sense to somebody else. Or if you tell somebody to do it a certain way, that may not make sense to them. And you also want to not stand in their way and say, do it my way or not at all, because I feel like I've heard that a lot (laughs) and that doesn't work for me. It works for me when I've found a problem and almost solved the problem on my own. Yes, like we can all, somebody that's you can or I can tell somebody what we believe is the best way to do it, but we still need to be open to 
hearing them out or letting them wrestle through it in order to find their way of doing it because they might come up with a better way than us. I mean, we're all human, so we have what works for us. In the process of also making a mistake, it gets you to appreciate perhaps some of the learning that's being you're being exposed to, knowing why you're being taught that. Yeah, that's the same thing. I've had the privilege of talking with new instructors across the country now because of this whole thing and getting talking with some of their students and doing some presentations here and there. And what's really nice about that is to let them know that there's no magical formula. We all have to struggle through it. And the best way, at least when I'm talking with the teachers, is they felt like how I felt, which is they're not equipped enough in order to do the job. And I keep reminding them, I was like, well, no, it has to do with the care that you have for those students. And everybody's in a different situation. Everybody's living in a different market, meaning that if you're serving your county students or maybe your state, maybe it's the bottom half of the state or near the beach or whatever it may be, you have a certain market that you are an expert in and you can give the keys to the kingdom to those students. But the big thing that I do tell them is to let the students feel and see the problem first, then teach them some of the solutions, and then go back in the shop again and let them figure it out now. It's if you just take them into a classroom and you tell them all the answers, nobody cares. You could have the best curriculum in the world, and you could be correct in everything. It doesn't mean that there's going to be any retention in that student whatsoever. They have to struggle with whatever it is. So if you're like the one thing I was doing, and it's funny, but it makes them get used to how to handle pipe wrenches is I did not let them use a pipe vise. They had to put sections of piping it together with just the two pipe wrenches on the table. You had to figure out how to hold it, what to do, no matter what it was, whether it's sheet metal or brazing, whatever it was. And even with electrical, we built these electrical training boards that drew a very low current that was fairly safe. We had them wear their gloves and things before they're working on any type of high current things. Something that's very simple, put the multimeter in the hand, teach them the basics, make them test out with some electrical safety stuff, but then get them onto those boards, like make the board first, then test the board while you're teaching electricity. Because if you start by just teaching it, nobody cares. Yeah. You're just not going to have any retention whatsoever. You're going to be saying the same things over and over. It's going to be dry. And so you have to do that. But In pursuit of your certificate of eligibility to teach, you did a lot of writing, a lot of papers. Did that lead directly or indirectly to you writing your books? Not directly. Yeah. So to pick up where we're left off at. So now I'm teaching in the classroom. I'm seeing, I'm trying to pick up resources and things to teach the students. And I'm struggling to find the things that I know are valuable to the students. And so I might find a couple pages, two, four pages here, this book, two, four pages there, six pages here. And it's like, man, there is not something out there that teaches the procedures. Everything was written by somebody that was not in the field and had maybe, I kind of realize now, maybe they just didn't know the procedures. Maybe it's just like, it was just theory or something. I, I don't know what it was. But in a lot of books, I found that it was just theory and they would literally skirt around the procedures and not even give one procedure that may be like an older style procedure. It was just avoiding it. And so that was something that I found was key, was probably the most important because I can't teach the theory until I give you, like I let the students struggle through a procedure. They're not going to care about the theory until they actively do that procedure, whatever it may be. So then I started coming up with my own procedures of course, there's procedures out there already, and we have them, and they're field recognized, and even just superheat and subcoin. But it's the order in which you're stating it, or how clear it is, is what I felt like that was important. So I started making like quick cheat cheat kind of things that I would hand to the students and say, "This is the most important thing I'm ever going to give you. Don't lose it." And so in the back of the classroom, they had some cheat cheat stuff to work with, and I always wanted to stay away from rules of thumb, but always do certainties because a rule of thumb will get you close and that's all it's going to ever get you. But if you can do a full procedure, then you're going to know for a fact. It'd be like the same thing as like doing a vacuum versus doing a vacuum with a standing vacuum test. There's a lot of people out there that will just do the vacuum and not verify that their vacuum is 100% complete and that there's no problems by doing a decay test. And your system's leak proof. Yeah, exactly. So the certainty, that's that extra step that adds value to the work that you're teaching people to do. Yeah, absolutely. So in the midst of all that, 
I started handing out these sheets. I kept making more and more sheets. I didn't really have any passion for writing or anything like that because I like to communicate. I like to see the students struggle through it and help them in order for them to realize what and why they're doing what they're doing. But in the midst of that, a friend of mine had said YouTube videos, right? Because I was using a couple YouTube videos in the classroom, like three, five minute videos to introduce a subject matter. Especially that first year of teaching, I remember I was just trying to get any type of resources I could get my hands on. And that's where we have, we've made these PowerPoints and stuff like that, which we feel like, hey, this can at least give somebody a place to start. So a friend of mine had said, hey, why don't you do some videos? He's like, if I was in the construction trades nowadays, I would definitely be doing some videos because they seem to get a lot of traction and stuff like that. And I was like, yeah, maybe. (laughs) And so I went home and I bought a Logitech camera, C920, and no audio or anything. And I did how to cut a downspout with some tin snips. I grabbed a piece of downspout. I grabbed some tin snips and I cut it like I would cut a rectangular or circular duct. And it was the very first video that we did. And that video still gets like 100 views or a couple hundred views a day or something like that. That's just kind of funny. Anyway, that was the first video I did. I didn't edit anything. I just did it one time and that was it. Because I had no idea how to edit. (laughs) I was just like, oh, let's try this. So at that time, we were using like, say, a gray furnace main videos and stuff like that. I learned a lot just by watching videos and reading some of the articles that I could find online in order to try to answer subjects. And that's where it started. I started making videos really for my students so that they had the procedure and I'm showing it to them. So not only in the classroom, but like for their retention, they could go back and watch the videos again. And it's almost like your cheat sheet. You've organized it, you've studied it, you scrutinized it, you put it together. Okay, now this can be repeated and delivered, and then you can fill in the, the gaps and the differences. Have you ever read the book called The Checklist Manifesto? I have not. No, I have not. You should write that down. It's pretty brief. I believe it was literally written by a brain surgeon. And it's what surgeons do to make sure that things are done correctly. Nice. But it sounds like you're already employing that naturally. So I don't know. <laughs> I still remember the day I had a student go sit down at his desk and we had a small like teaching area, but everybody was all crammed in. But he sat down at his desk and he went on his phone and I was going to bust his chops about it. And then all of a sudden I realized he's watching one of the videos. I just (laughs) asked him to go do the procedure outside on the unit. And I'm like, oh, man, I felt like an idiot. I'm like, geez, because the kids are checking on their cell phones and all that stuff. And you got to watch that. He's exhibiting some care and concern for wanting to do it right. So that's really cool. Yeah, it was funny. So that's really, there was no traction with any of those videos. I talk about that downspout, the downspout, none of those videos for the first three, four months had any traction, say, on YouTube or whatever. And so the only reason I even had to continue making them was for my students. And I was like, you know what? This way I have them for them. I could assign them, say I'm sick or something like that. Inevitably, I would get sick like, three times a year just from, I guess, all the sicknesses in the school and stuff like that. So I could assign them some of those. And because the substitutes coming in, unfortunately, wouldn't have the correct credentials to let them in the back of the shop. And that's unfortunate. So maybe I was out very (laughs) minimal amount of times that was not okay with me. So maybe three times a year out of maybe 185 day year. So I could assign them those. So anyway, that summer happened. And all of a sudden, the video started taking off and I started getting feedback from people saying how much it meant to them in the comments section. And to me, I was never a big social media person or anything like that. And so I was not on any of that. And I just thought, well, there's a lot of negativity on social media. Like, that's just what I thought. And that was it. But I didn't see anything like that on YouTube. It was just all this like, thank you, blessed to have this video or whatever. And so I was thinking, wow, that was highly encouraging. And so I just continued making the videos. Validates what you're doing. Yeah. I just looked right now. You have 285,000 subscribers. Yeah. (laughs) That is an enormous amount of subscribers. And some of your videos have hundreds of thousands of views, like you mentioned. Yeah, it's been a crazy journey. (laughs) Yeah. And it's only since 2016. Yeah. I mean, I wish I did the early videos in like a better quality. I was just not that person. I was more of a teacher, a technician teacher. I was not a media kind of person. And so... There's another part of the story where, oh, actually, I'll back up a little bit. While I was teaching, I taught at the local school for six years for the high school students. So what was happening is I had the two young kids at home. I was teaching during the daytime. I was teaching two night 
part-time classes a week. I still had my company. I was doing service at nights and the weekends, and I was doing changeouts. And at the same time, I was doing the videos, and then I started writing the book. So you figured out how to sleep one hour a night is what I'm hearing. There. Well, <laughs> apparently I didn't because I ended up getting mono. And what happened was by 11 o'clock, I had no idea what was wrong with me. My last school year, by 11 o'clock, I couldn't think right anymore. My mind was just so cloudy. I just fighting through it. I just had no idea what was going on. And so I finally, I think that happened in like January or something like that. And by April is when like over the whatever Easter break kind of thing is when I found out what it was. I just was thinking maybe I'm just working too much and just tired. Well, no, it was that. And so that affects everybody's bodies differently. But for me, I just, I could not think. I just was so tired all the time. And ever since then, I still had like a little bit, I don't feel mentally the same as I did before that. <laughs> so that's just life. So anyway, I decided to leave the school, not just for that reason, but other reasons as well. And I wanted to pursue finishing this book that I had written. And even when I thought it was finished, it was not. So during this time, I decided I was going to leave and I was working on the book. And basically, I was concerned that maybe what I was writing did not quite make sense. And so a good friend of mine who had just retired, who was an English and math teacher, he was actually an elder at our church. I had known him real well and trusted him and asked him, hey, would you be willing to work with me in order to fix up the book and make it say what I wanted to say? And so we went over that thing so many times, so, so many times to the point where every single word is exactly the way I wanted it now, which is great. It took almost another full year, even when I thought after six months it was done. So it took like another six, maybe eight months, even when I thought it was done to actually be complete. And at that time, I mean, we were actually calling. That was what, 2018, 2017, 2018. We were actually calling some manufacturers, trying to see what we could do with the images. Because I'm like, man, I have no idea how to draw these images. And, and I wasn't really getting any return phone calls back. At that time, it just was a different point in time. and so we decided, well, we'll just make the images ourselves <laughs> somehow. And so somebody else that we're really good friends with was a graphic designer. And so she was drawing images. I had a friend of mine who's an engineer make other images like the gauge sets and the systems and stuff like that. And so we were able to make most of the images. We did have several manufacturers help us out with some images in there at that time. So it did end up working out. We got the images that we wanted and published a book in 2019, in May of 2019, yeah. And so right before that, before I published the book, I felt technologically limited, <laughs> we'll say, and figured I needed some help. And so a friend of mine who basically was in the youth group when I was helping out at youth group, I've been involved with him in his life for like 14 years and he's been a good friend with me. I've been a good friend with him. We decided that it would be a good idea. We took it very slowly as far as me bringing them aboard into AC Service Tech as a full-time team member. And so he helped me step up the technological kind of game. And we eventually kind of stepped up the audio, stepped up the video production capabilities. And he helped to build the website and all of that type of stuff in order to even sell the book. And now it's on Amazon and iTunes or Apple Bookstore and Google Play, all that stuff. But so he helped with that. It's kind of like the, putting the pieces of the puzzle together in order to, he kind of saw the vision, kind of saw that I wanted to teach others. And there's just only so much that one person can do. I'm looking on your website right now and it's available at acservicetech.com. And then do you have access to, what are all the things you can get from their website? Well, so we have articles and quizzes and calculators. And then we, as far as what we sell is the, we have our book, refrigerant charging book, it's 229 pages. We have a thousand question workbook and that has an answer key as well. So it's a self-study guide. We have quick reference cards made out of polystyrene. I did like oven tests on them and refrigerant oil tests and all kinds of stuff, making sure that they would hold up well and it's just funny. You'd never think, but that's our life. That's the kind of person you are. You take it to the experimental level, even with paper, <laughs> <laughs> with books. Look at it, man. Yeah, yeah. And then we even did these posters and PowerPoints. And it's just crazy because I wouldn't have thought even the posters were as popular as what they are because people want to hang them in their shops and in the classrooms. I know that the refrigeration cycle was something that I struggled through with teaching because they would say, Mr. Mig, I understand what's happening with that square on the board. 
Like, I understand that. But where is the system at in relation to these things that I'm looking at? I would slowly start making the refrigeration cycle, basically putting that onto systems. I would circle like, hey, this is the outdoor unit. Physical world. Yeah. Right. And then I started putting the coils and stuff like that over systems. I actually, while I was teaching, I made a whole refrigeration cycle. Well, I made the air conditioning and heat pump and AC mode and heat pump and heating mode in Google or in Microsoft Paint, one pixel at a time. (laughs) Oh, God. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you could highlight it and you could do multiple pixels, but literally that was my skill level at the time, which was nothing. It was just one of those things that was like in my way. I wanted to make sure I could do it and communicate it well. And how do I communicate that to somebody else who's an artist or whatever? We started off with those Microsoft Paint ones. Then we obviously moved them into Illustrator and other things. And we had some help making some of the newer images. And yeah, so it's been a long journey. And as far as writing a book goes, I needed help. The long and short of life is that you cannot do things on your own, even when you have a passion, desire, like you're going to push and try and do everything. And you're going to do the best you can. But there's going to be a certain point where you feel you need some help. And I'm thankful for each of the people that are here now and that have helped in our journey. And just a lot. The one individual, Frank Ackley, he was a retired English and math teacher. He helped huge, like huge with making that thousand question workbook. A thousand questions. People are like, what do you mean a thousand? Yeah, a thousand. It's a thousand of the exact questions that I want you to know. And I want you to know the answers to. And then we didn't just do them all as A, B, C, D. We did five different ways to ask a question. The sequence, like a procedure, step one, step two, step three, step four, step five, word banks and A, B, C, D, true and false and open-ended. Because I will tell you this, that in the classroom, there's no A, B, C, D questions to be had because I did not want the feedback that I was getting to be a guess. Everything was open-ended. You had to write it out, circle it, write it. Yeah. So I know if you understand the topic or you do not. And that was it. So we, I would make up all of my own quizzes or tests or whatever we did in the classroom. And then sometimes they were procedural, the project based. So it's not all just about written. It's about, can a student do a project? Can they explain how it works? Can they do the troubleshooting? Are they safe? It's a matter of assessing a student to know where they're at. But I believe it. you need multiple mediums in order to do that. So right now, what does your work life consist of? <laughs> Not in detail every day, but just what are you doing? What's the main focus? Are you still doing contracting? So I shut down the, it was half carpentry, half HVAC, but really as I was teaching all those years, I had shut down the carpentry side and I was just doing the HVAC side of the business just to, in order to keep myself fresh for the student's sake. But I kept that alive until like about a year ago, about a year and a half ago, where I said, I just want to focus on just education. And I just can't do it. I can't do all of that. And I still am doing like the testing and things like that. We do some things for some manufacturers as well. Everybody's in the process of learning. Everybody. It doesn't matter where you're at in your stage of life or experience. We're all just digging in. And of course, we dig into things that we don't know or or that we find exciting or new. Something that I was just recently playing around with was the exact amount of CFM loss out of the condensate line, out of a furnace and a coil as a positive pressure. And then also as a negative pressure, I didn't post that full video yet. I posted another one on mini split. Like if a mini split needs a condensate line where I was measuring the air velocity of a wall hung unit. But anyway, you just, you figure out how to do it accurately with the tools that you have and you figure out your ways of doing it. And, or like I said, we're all on a learning journey. Do you have demo equipment to do your videos on? What's your office out setup look like? So we just bought the building in which we're in about a year, a little bit over a year ago, and we're still setting it up. We have a training room on the one side, and so we have a mix of new and used equipment. Some of the local contractors in the area, I asked to try to grab and save some of the bad components. I have most of the bad components I've had over my lifetime ended up staying over at the school. (laughs) And then I had some that I was still pulling and things like that. So I've got a good amount, but that's a pretty important thing is finding all of the bad components so that you can explain why they're bad. And so a lot of the videos that we're doing are how things can break. It's kind of like that dot on the paper and then coming at it from multiple different sides. And so it's not just a matter of coming at it from all these different angles as far as a troubleshooting mindset, because you have to approach a system 
And you have to first be able to identify it, first listen to the customer, then identify the system, and then identify the components within the system because furnaces, that's another video that we have coming out. And it's a presentation that I was doing at the HVACR symposium, but like the evolution of how gas furnaces have changed over 60, 80 years. And so all the components that kind of were in in the evolution of these furnaces as far as safety and components and how they're changing and efficiency for gas and electrical. But anyway, so you have to identify all those components to see if you understand them, be able to read a wiring diagram. But basically then you have to then watch for error codes. The biggest important thing that you needed to do was listen to the customer because they know what the system should sound like or do, and now it's not doing that thing. They're your data logger. Yeah, yeah. They've been there for a while, logging data in their mind, perceptions. Exactly. Yeah. And so basically, in a troubleshooting spot, you want to be able to cut out half, three quarters of the components and dial into the certain area. So if it's like a sequence of operation error in a gas furnace, it's like you want to identify that spot in the sequence or end one step earlier and then think about the components that could be wrong that's affecting that. It's not just a pressure switch that's the problem. It's a condensate line or a blockage in the exhaust. Or there's a lot of different things. And sometimes for me, I feel like you have to get like a good topic in order to not trick somebody into learning, but like in order to get all of the things out that you know are important, that you know that they're going to run into, but not necessarily that they're looking for, if that makes sense. So they get a bunch of troubleshooting diagnostics in their mind. That's the problem, I think, a little bit with YouTube. It's like only the say the popular problems get attention, but some of the common problems that people just don't know about, that they just happen to get by on, that seems to be an, an issue. I remember traveling, a company had hired me to come out and do some training for them. And I had a, one of the guys come over to me and it's like, don't say anything to anybody, but I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just, I'm a really good guesser. Wow. And I'm like, oh boy. A, B, C, D, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm like, oh man. He's like, I'm really good at remembering what fixed the problem last time, but I have no idea what's causing or how to diagnose it or anything. And I'm like, wow, okay. So it's just trying to teach people that sequence or how to troubleshoot, you know, or, and how to do it safely really too. That's the key. And not to get overwhelmed because a lot of people's mind space gets, you freak out a little bit and then your mind is not, good for you anymore while you're trying to troubleshoot. And that's why you need resources like your book, your cards, the posters, things like that to reactivate things to help you recall past learning. Yeah. I mean, I think I got a little bit into like the (laughs) troubleshooting diagnosis. I think I got off of your question there. No. So, but I don't even remember what the question was, to be quite honest at this point. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, we're just looking at what you've done out there and the resources you provide. Do you actually, with that lab, do you train people in person? So I might start doing that soon, just locally, I think. I don't need to do some big kind of grandiose. It's not that I don't need, it's, I think that people have a different perception of you when they don't know you, if that makes sense. People are willing to fly in and do all this. They think you talk like the way you talk in in your YouTube videos. <laughs> and I feel like I'm going to let them down. Like, hey, this is just me. You know what I'm saying? So like, I'm happy with just doing some, hey, half a dozen, a dozen just in person, let's just do targeting on a two or three hour course or something like that or class here and there. That's what I'm hoping to target. But really, it's mainly the training rooms mainly to do the videos. But I do get a chance every once in a while to travel out to sites and do some training. But I would like to do a little bit of training once twice a week in the classroom that we're building. We're not there yet, just because everything takes time. And in fact, it's like a frustration because you're just not where you want to be at. The imagination will always take you faster (laughs) than the real world gets you there. But I think also having the training room for you to get the hands-on training experience to get feedback from students. Oh, yeah. So that your other materials can be more robust because you don't know what other people don't know. Yes. I believe in that wholeheartedly. In fact, I say that to some of our team here. I was like, I got to get back in the classroom. I got to get here. I got to get there. But then you end up, it's like this weird thing, weird dynamic where we're at now there's a certain amount of time that's needed by me here. And for me to go out and do it somewhere else, it becomes a little difficult to keep everything else like flowing. arranged. The w- yeah. yeah, flowing. I mean, even with the amount of schools and high schools, colleges and stuff like that, contact and things, we have a great distribution coordinator. Patty is over there and we have different people that are coming aboard and we have 
there's only so many things that we can do essentially. And I, that's what kind of frustrates me because I have these a vision of what I want to do and it just doesn't feel like I'm going to get there. And I think I shared that with you a little bit. Yeah. We were talking at some Florida. Yeah. Yeah. But I think just if anything, yeah. in time, it'll come along. And it sounds like you have the spirit, the passion, the dedication. I wrote down some things here, like you're tenacious and you teach with conviction. You validate what you teach. Just all those really essential, honorable elements are going to keep you moving ahead. Keep the vision out there and look for opportunities to make it come true. With And like you said, drawing on others, help from others to do it, picking those right people to help you do it. Yeah, I mean, that's something that I've really honed in on lately is that my ability to self-assess, anybody else's ability to self-assess what they're capable of doing, it's limited in the sense of what experience they have. Like, hey, I'm great at this. Well, we need to work on that, you know what I mean? Because, and I need to be open to that too and, and hear that from other people. And that was a huge growing thing for me on YouTube was that People would call me out, not in the negative sense, like in the early, especially the early videos, like, hey, you said this wrong, like Delta T, like the, I said, oh, the temperature difference between here and here. And they're like, that's not a difference. That's a change because it's the same thing. And I just, I didn't realize what I was saying, but that's helped me. It's cleaned it up. Yeah. And it's like being open to maybe you're not correct. That's absolutely fine. I mean, we're all human. We learn from each other. And so I learn from others and others learn from what I'm saying and doing. And it just, that's why. Sometimes I'm a little maybe too selective on even topics that I do, make videos on or things like that, because it's just, I want to be very precise in what I'm saying. And if I don't feel like I'm either 100% or if I feel that I'm not fully excited about that topic, I don't want to put that out quite yet. We're just doing HVAC training videos, right? <laughs> That's kind of where we're at. And we're just trying to do what we can. We say here, uh, AC service tech, we're trying. <laughs> <laughs> One of the best pleasures that I get now is what's cool is to be able to help an HVAC teacher that maybe has six months or a year in or two years. Like we get emails and we get on Facebook and or whatever. We get contacts come in where it's somebody that's a new teacher. And I remember what that was like. I specifically remember that. And so a lot of times I'm able to talk with that teacher and be able to give them encouragement and be able to give them some of the tools or resources or where to look for or how administrations operate, like how school systems operate, because they're still trying to figure it all out. And it's just overwhelming to them. And they feel, like I said, that they're not good enough. And I'm like, man, I'm telling you that a lot of times it's you have all of this experience because I would get to know a little bit about them. It doesn't have to be a long conversation, half an hour conversation. I get to hear a little bit about their history and about what their area. And I realize that students, like all the teachers are worried about getting all of this knowledge into that student's head. And I'm like, well, wait a second here, because not only should you be doing that, but one of the most important things for you to do is to make sure that they have their tool use down. That any tool that they're going to get handed as a helper or an apprentice in the field, they need to be able to do that well. Otherwise, the person that they're working with is not going to give them a chance to do a higher level thing. And so the knowledge is only there to allow them to grow fast after they make their initial splash. I did not mean to make that rhyme, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> that's extremely important. And that's something that I always am reminding everybody. And I feel like that helps take the edge off for a new teacher. They're like, okay, it's okay to teach how to use tin snips and how to put a box together, or how to bend and things or how to put outlets in and use the hand tools. Like, absolutely, you need that. And in fact, right before my students would graduate, when I was teaching at the technical school, I would go back and say, look, now you are going to start in the field literally this summer, or maybe they got to the summer before just as an apprentice somewhere. But if you don't show your tool use, like uh, proficient tool use, you're going to be messed up, man. And so I would ask them, what do you feel that you're weak in? Because there would be like these high level things, like I would assign them troubleshooting service calls within the classroom, like I would mess stuff up purposely. I'm not a very big fan on all the switches, like adding a switch in a system to, to turn off a certain section of the system. Because if I'm the technician and I'm troubleshooting that, I'm going to find where you splice the wire at and be like, I don't get it. It takes a lot more time and I totally understand why people do it. And that's absolutely fine. I get it. I totally get it. But I would put faults in that you couldn't see. 
even in the lines or cut with tin snips, similars, or a diagonal pliers or whatever in spots where you wouldn't see. And I would put faults in things, make fuses pop, and not dangerous faults, but ones that they would have to take a high level of skill, the exact same thing as out in the field. So I would literally mix that, that high level thing with, oh, you need to practice your basic skills before you leave here. Yeah, that's like the entry fee to getting more challenging work or to be offered the opportunity to do more challenging work. 100%. Yes. Very cool. We wanted to talk about the desire to teach and not letting anything stop you. And I think you just described that in the last few minutes here. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing has stopped this man. You're really an awesome guy. Really glad I got a chance to talk with you at length at the HVAC Symposium. And that's what yeah, led too. us to talking here today. And I wanted your story to get out there and share your enthusiasm, your dedication, and also let people know about you the resources you provide, the books, the workbooks, the thousand question quizzes, the cards. Those are all great materials. And you also offer materials in Spanish too. I saw that in your site. That was another thing too, is that we have a lot of Spanish speaking individuals, whether you were born or you came into the United States as a Spanish speaker already. The whole point is that I had some Spanish speaking students in my classroom that understood technical documents better in Spanish than they did English. And so by us making a Spanish paperback and a Spanish workbook, I think that allows somebody to grow. It all has to do with desire, right? So I don't want anything standing in somebody's way. So if standing in their way is that they could speak English really well and everything is fine, but they were raised in a family of Spanish speakers, maybe for reading a document or taking a quiz or whatever, if I write that in Spanish, then they're going to be able to understand the topics. And then they can, in the field, you may not have to write as much and you're communicating verbally a lot. And so I just wanted to not have anything be holding somebody back. And so we were really particular with that translation as well, because I wanted to make sure it was the correct Spanish translation. Yeah. It wasn't just Google Translate. No. No, <laughs> no. And that was my biggest concern. I'm like, and the feedback we got was great. And in fact, any of the negative feedback that we got was actually because they didn't understand the technical nature of HVAC. Like they were like, you translated this wrong and you wrote fixed orifice, but what you really meant was a piston. And I was like, oh man, like this, they just don't know what a fixed orifice is yet. And so they just didn't read enough of it yet or read other technical documents to understand Oh, a fixed orifice, it, that means, oh, it could be a capillary tube, it could be a piston, and they are all fall under the same thing of a fixed orifice. <laughs> but other than that, no, it was pretty good. Excellent. I want to thank you for coming on the podcast and sharing your story. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I hope it's been inspirational for the listeners out there. Look forward to seeing you again in the future. And someday I think I want to get out and see your lab, see your offices there. It sounds pretty cool. Sounds good. All right. We'd love to have you. Thank you, Craig, and thank you for listeners on the podcast, and we'll be back at you again next time. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Building HVAC Science Podcast. If you want to keep up with other things that we find interesting here, follow us on Facebook by typing Building HVAC Science into the Facebook search bar. I also host the Res Talk podcast where you can learn more about the rapidly evolving world of home energy ratings and peripheral topics. And after listening, if you like what you heard today and you've not subscribed to the podcast, please consider doing so by typing Building HVAC Science into the search bar, one of these services out there that you use to catch your podcast. The Building HVAC Science Podcast is a production of True Tech Tools Limited. I want to thank you for listening. If you want to reach out to me, you can contact me at Bill, B-I-L-L, -L, at truetechtools.com. Thanks a lot and have a great day.